Good evening, and thank you for joining us for this scoping meeting, Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency's Aquaterra Water Bank Project. We're glad that you made the time to <clears throat> participate in this meeting, and we look forward to receiving your input later in the meeting and during the remainder of the scoping period. My name is David Monroe, and I work for an environmental consulting company called TetraTech. TetraTech is assisting the McMullen Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency, or MAGSA, and the Bureau of Reclamation in preparation of the NEPA and CEQA document for this project, as well as the public involvement tasks. Our team includes staff from MAGSA, the Bureau of Reclamation, Provost and Pritchard, and Bashan and Associates. I'd like to ask the other members of the team who are with us tonight to introduce themselves, starting with MAGSA. Matt? Good evening, folks. My name is Matt Hurley. I, uh, I am the general manager of the McMullen Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency, or as David indicated, our affectionately termed MAGSA. You'll hear that a lot tonight. Uh, and also for the purposes of this environmental review, uh, I serve in the role of the project director. So good evening and welcome. Crystal? So I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Crystal Tufangshin and myself, Rebecca Quist. We're both with the Kings River Conservation District and we help support on MAGSA outreach. Thank you. From the Bureau of Reclamation, Rain. Good evening, um, I'm Rain Emerson. I am the um, Acting Water Conservation Branch Chief for our regional office, as well as the Environmental Compliance Branch Chief for the South Central California Area Office. I will be overseeing the environmental compliance for this project. Irma. Good evening, my name is Irma Leal on the Contracts Administration Branch out of the Fresno office. Welcome. Kathy. Kathy, are you on? Let's see, we can come back to Kathy. Uh, from Tetra Tech, uh, we have myself, uh, David Monroe. I am the project manager for the environmental for the environmental review. Erica? Yeah, hi, I'm Erica Ansel, also with Tetra Tech, like David. Um, I'm an environmental scientist and I'll be helping out with the NEPA and CEQA documentation, the environmental documentation for the Aquatera Water Bank um, and helping to coordinate the process. Thank you. Our lead design firm is Provost and Pritchard Consulting Group. Our lead uh, engineer is Lynn Groundwater Muller. Is Lynn on? Lynn may be a little bit late. I'm here. Thanks, Lynn. Maybe just in time. Uh, good evening, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> my name is Lynn Groundwater Muller, and I work for Provost and Pritchard Consulting Group. And myself, along with Randy Hopkins, are helping with the engineering of this project. Thanks, Lynn. And from Bashan and Associates, we have uh, Phil Bashan as our principal investigator. Phil? Hello, I'm hello, I'm Dr. Phil Bashan with uh, Bashan Associates. I'm providing a broad technical and scientific support uh, for this project, um, particularly as related to on-farm recharge programs and supporting project elements. Uh, welcome. Thank you. We'll move on to the agenda. So this is the agenda for tonight's meeting. We'll start with details of how to listen to or watch the presentation and describe how you can submit comments or questions. We'll then provide you with a description of the McMullen Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency, including its formation, composition, and goals. We'll follow with a description of the proposed project, including construction and operations features. During the purpose and need discussion, We'll provide information about the goals of the project and the reasons that MAGSA is proposing to implement the project. We will describe opportunities for the public to participate, including the schedule for preparation of the NEPA CEQA document and the release of documents for public review. At the end of the presentation, we'll open the floor for your questions or comments. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and all discussion will become part of the public record. I will now hand the presentation over to Rebecca Quist, who will address translation and Zoom webinar details. Rebecca? 
Great, thank you, David. And I do want to apologize. Um, uh, the Zoom features are a little bit limited while I'm sharing my screen, but I want to try to make the transition as smooth as possible for the translation. So um, first, I'll go ahead and let Reina um, explain how folks can take advantage of the translation, and then I'm going to stop sharing my screen and enable the translation. So Reina, uh, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Muy buenas noches a todos. Bienvenidos a esta presentación de lo que es la Agencia de Sostenibilidad del área de McMullen para lo que es el agua subterránea. Uh, acabamos de escuchar una presentación de quién y quién va a escuchar usted el día de hoy, incluyendo los patrocinadores, uh, las agencias que están involucradas. Y también acabamos de repasar lo que es la agenda. Uh, van a repasar y comenzar con lo que son las logísticas de la reunión, incluyendo un repaso de lo que es el plan de sostenibilidad para lo que es el área de McMullen y también van a repasar lo que es el propósito y las necesidades para esta noche y después de eso van a pasar a lo que es la participación pública donde esperamos que usted pueda participar. Le invitamos a que someta sus comentarios, preguntas en su lenguaje. Estamos dando la bienvenida y no sienta ninguna no se sienta frustrado con ese proceso. Estamos aquí para apoyar completamente y vamos a cerrar con comentarios públicos. Así es que en un momento, um, en este momento, Rebeca va, está encendiendo lo que es la interpretación y asignando al, va a asignar al intérprete que va a estar ayudando el día de hoy. En un momento usted va a ver un icono que parece un mundo abajo de su pantalla. Si usted está en una computadora. Si usted está en un celular o una tableta, sus opciones van a ser diferentes. Usted verá los tres puntitos que indican más o more options y usted va a seleccionar esos tres puntitos uh, o el icono de mundo. Después de eso, usted va a seleccionar su lenguaje de preferencia. En este caso será el español. Después de que seleccione el lenguaje de español, le invito a que seleccione um, silenciar el audio original y tal vez en su computadora o en su celular diga mute original audio y de esta manera usted solamente escuchará la presentación en su lenguaje de preferencia y por último oprima listo y estará completamente listo para escuchar esta um, presentación en su lenguaje de preferencia. If you are a monolingual English only speaker, I do invite you to also select the interpretation channel so that that way, uh, if we do have any questions or comments in Spanish, you would be able to hear the interpretation. All you have to do is select the icon at the bottom of the screen in a moment. You will not see it yet, but in a moment you will see an icon that looks like a world. And once you select that icon, you will click it and select the English language and you will be ready to go. Everything else will be just as normal, except if we do have any Spanish comments or questions, you will hear the real-time translate interpretation. With that, um, if we can assign our interpreter, Rebecca, that would be awesome. So at this moment, we can go ahead and get translation started. Con eso, en este momento, vamos a encender lo que es la interpretación. Great, thank you so much, Reina. I'm gonna go ahead and get William into the room. Okay, great. So I think we should be good to go. All right, Crystal, do you wanna go ahead and move on to the next slide? Thanks for joining us again. Um, a few housekeeping details before I move ahead into the rest of our content for the evening. Um, for all who are participating um, in tonight's scoping session, I want to let you know that your video and your microphones are turned off and will remain off for the session. And we also want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and it'll be made available on MAGS's YouTube channel and website as soon as possible following the conclusion of the event. We'll also send a link to the video uh, to our email list. If you're not on our email list, you can 
visit our website at www.mcmullenarea.org to sign up and we'll make, or you can uh, drop your email in the Q&A box. Let us know you'd like to be added and we can make sure that you're added to that list. And to keep the flow of information throughout the presentation, questions will be addressed at the conclusion of the entire presentation. If you have any questions that arise during the presentation, please feel free to type those into the Q&A box feature at any time, and they will be read aloud and answered at the end. And any comments from the public will be taken and recorded at this webinar. So near the end of the presentation, we'll open up a dedicated time for comment submittal, and we will collect those again via that Q&A feature available on your Zoom menu. So we'll make a note to verify that we've received your comment, that it has been recorded, and more details on how to use that Q&A box to submit a comment will be provided towards the end. And with that, I'd like to hand it back over to our host, David. Thank you, Rebecca. In this segment, we'd like to provide you with a description of the McMullen Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency, or MAGSA. MAGSA General Manager Matt Hurley will describe MAGSA in terms of its original formation, structure, and goals. Matt? Thank you, David. Let's go with the next slide. McMullen Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency, or MAGSA, was, uh, was recently formed actually in 2017 uh, as a result of the passage by the legislature of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014. Uh, we're located in Fresno County on the kind of the West Central area. If you look at the map of California, you'll see that we are at the almost dead center of California. Uh, we, we think of ourselves as being the center of the universe sometimes. Uh, we are comprised of about 120,000 acres, about 90% roughly uh, permanent and field crops. The rest is uh, ecological preserves and uh, some rural residential. And uh, some of the most important items relative to MAGS are that we have no surface water rights on the Kings River uh, for surface irrigation. So we're a groundwater only area, which under the terms of SIGDA would make us 100% white area. And, that, and we're the only GSA in the Kings Subbasin uh, with that circumstance. Uh, so we're, we're groundwater only. We make our agricultural living off of the groundwater. And because of that, a fairly large uh, cone of depression has developed over the last 100 years or so beneath our, our boundaries now. And so uh, uh, that's also been a bad thing for overdraft, but a good thing for creating large amounts of available storage space. So uh, with that, let's move on to the next slide. Our GSP or our groundwater sustainability plan is currently under review by the Department of Water Resources, but it, uh, it sets out several goals for us. Uh, first and foremost is we're interested in creating a viable, successful uh, GSA that serves our public's interest. Uh, we really, really have an interest in, in uh, working with our regional partners to develop projects and programs like a water bank. And we also would like to uh, you know, be involved in that long-term strategy for sustainability, which includes uh, acquiring outside water and importing it in, uh, developing critical infrastructure, and coming up with creative financing to make it all work. Next, next slide, please. <clears throat> We're governed by a five-member board of, uh, of directors. Uh, we have uh, one member from the County of Fresno, it's Supervisor Brian Pacheco, uh, two Raisin City uh, Water District board members, Director Guggen Bath and Director Don Cameron, who also serves as the chairman of our board. We have the Mid Valley Water District represented by Director Jeevan Singh. And then we have a at-large landowner who's appointed by the county, uh, Director Matt Abercrombie, who also serves as a vice chair. If you look to the right there, you see the blue hatched area represents the area currently uh, under the jurisdiction of the Raisin City Water District. And the black hatched area is the Mid Valley Water District. Um, next, next slide, please. Now, uh, a big question that comes up on a regular basis with me especially is, you know, how does a water bank work? Uh, quite simply, a water bank uh, works just a lot like the financial model that we're used to when we go to the, the, the Bank of America or Chase Bank. Uh, it's a groundwater storage facility which operates on the, the deposit and withdrawal uh, theories. Uh, just like your, water, your, uh, your financial bank, our water bank 
um, is subject to overdraft, which coincidentally is what uh, what your bank calls uh, the condition that your bank account is in when you take out too much money, uh, more than you have. Well, we have overdraft here in the King Sub Basin, and so uh, interesting parallel there. Uh, but a water bank uses the empty space in the aquifers that have been created over the, the years of uh, excessive withdrawals. And in our case, uh, we have almost 2 million acre feet of storage. And so we're hoping to use that in a very productive way. Uh, there are two basic methods of, of depositing water <clears throat> into a water bank. One is by direct recharge, which means that we accept uh, imported water in through conveyance facilities and, and convey that water to recharge ponds, uh, direct recharge ponds, so that the water can be percolated into the, uh, the, on, uh, the aquifer, or in the alternative, which is a, a, a methodology that we're using here, the on-farm recharge, where we can bring water in and convey it directly to uh, active agricultural parcel, parcels for uh, recharge on, on their farms. Uh, the other method is in lieu uh, agreements that usually involve surface supplies being used in, as it says, in lieu of groundwater, and that allows for those surface water supplies to be used instead of the groundwater, thus leaving the groundwater in the ground uh, for future use. And last but not least, of course, that stored groundwater is intended to be recovered by those who are banking in the facility, and that, uh, that will occur through recovery wells that we'll use to pump that groundwater back out again. Important consideration to that, though, is there's always a leave behind. There's always uh, less water taken out than was put in. Uh, I guess not unlike your bank where they charge you fees. Uh, next step, please. This is a kind of a 30,000 foot look. Uh, another little look at the mapping for MAGSA and part of our water banking facilities to the right, which you'll hear about more later from Lynn Groundwater. But that's our, uh, I call it our little dragon there, right at the confluence of the San Joaquin and the Kings Rivers at the Mendota Pool and also the Delta Mendota Canal. and. Uh, perfectly situated uh, to be a, a hub in a, in a large wheel of water management for the benefit of not only MAGSA, but for the, the area in general. And with that, I'll hand it, hand it back to David. Thank you, David. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> the NEPA and CEQA document will include a purpose and needs statement, which is developed to provide the public the context under which a project is proposed. The purpose and needs statement clarifies why we are proposing this project and what must be addressed. The purpose of the Aquaterra Water Bank project is to bank water in wetter years when flood water and contract water is available to recharge the aquifer beneath MAGSA and to allow water agencies to recover and use this water during dry or normal years. The project is needed to improve the reliability of the water supply so farmers and other water users can predict groundwater supplies over the near and medium term. It is needed to provide irrigation water during dry years to help ensure that the MAGS area remains one of the most productive agricultural regions in the state and to help local water providers meet their sustainability requirements under the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. I'd like to discuss alternatives for, for a moment. Both NEPA and CEQA require analysis of alternatives. In this instance, we are evaluating a no action or no project alternative and a single action alternative. We have these divisions in nomenclature uh, as they are NEPA and CEQA specific. So NEPA refers to uh, no action and CEQA refers to no project. Uh, also NEPA refers to the proposed action and CEQA refers to the proposed project. <clears throat> The proposed action is the alternative that we are discussing tonight and which we will describe in more detail on subsequent slides. The proposed action is developed to address the purposes of and needs for the project. The no action alternative is uh, conveys the baseline conditions and is intended to uh, to describe the conditions that would likely persist or that are assumed to persist if the if the project is not is not implemented. With that, I would like to hand the discussion over to, uh, to Phil Bichand uh, to provide some background uh, for this project, uh, and, and then uh, uh, Lynn Groundwater will provide an overview of the, of the proposed project. Phil? Thanks, David. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's great. 
So the McMullen projects um, are developing infrastructure that will be used under the Aquaterra project. Uh, these projects are on-farm recharge projects. Matt discussed on-farm recharge, and it's when active farmlands are, are actively flooded to recharge to, to the underlying aquifer. So the McMullen projects are designed to divert available flood flows from the Kings River onto private farmlands for both direct recharge through on-farm recharge and in lieu recharge. These projects help address two important uh, issues uh, facing the region. One is uh, regional flood risk and one is uh, groundwater overdraft. So the McMullen projects include phase one and the McMullen expansion. And these project projects have covered the design, permitting, and construction of main conveyance canals and their associated elements, uh, which are pump stations, crossings, and turnouts. They also have included the development of an on-farm recharge program that will be implemented with participating private landowners. Next slide. Phase one has been funded through a DWR flood corridor grant and matching private funds. It covers approximately 5,000 acres and is designed to, ca to capture and recharge about 150 CFS of, flood of available flood flows from the Kings River. It uh, has required CEQA analysis to, to define its environmental effects and, any and to define any associated mitigations. And it also required an H&H &H analysis, which is a hydrologic and hydraulic analysis that was used to justify the project based on its flood uh, mitigation benefits. The conveyance system included both foundational and operational imp infrastructure. Foundational infrastructure was infrastructure designed to accommodate future expansion up to 500 CFS uh, of diversion capacity and recharge capacity. And the uh, project um, was also uh, is, a, is an award-winning project. So it's won two engineering awards. Uh, it won in 2017 the Governor's Environmental and Economic Leadership Award. Uh, the infrastructure uh, in Phase One is similar to what I talked to uh, I talked about in the previous for the previous slide. It's uh, and, and, and the key ones are a turnoff off the Kings River at the James Weir, a pump station at Floral Avenue, and a crossing under Highway 145, which is the McMullen grade. Um, it has, uh, phase one has a recharge capacity of about 10,000 acre feet per month when floodwaters are available. Next slide. The McMullen expansion is similar to phase one. It enables a capture and diversion of an additional 300 CFS and an additional recharge, recharge capacity of 16,000 acre feet per month. So together phase one and, phase, and the expansion uh, have the capacity of about 26,000 acre feet per month. It covers an additional 43,000 acres and it will receive its uh, flood flows through the phase one infrastructure. Um, it has similar conveyance elements uh, with pump stations, crossings, and canals. In all, there are three 300 CFS pump stations to move flood flows eastward against grade into the McMullen expansion area. Like the phase one project, it will also have an OFR program implemented by private farmers on private farmlands in cooperation with MAGSA. Um, and it will include both direct and in lieu recharge. Uh, both CEQA and NEPA analyses are being conducted for the expansion project. Uh, CEQA is expected to be completed in a couple months and NEPA by mid-2022. The McMullen expansion is receiving grant funds through the NRCS Regional Conservation Partnership Program, uh, the RCPP program, and through the State Water Board Prop 1 Stormwater Grant Program as well as matching local funds from MAGSA and its partners. So now we'll turn it over to Lynn to talk about the Aquaterra project. Thank you, Phil. This slide shows a zoomed out view of the MAGSA area and also some of where the waters will be coming from that'll be diverted into the groundwater bank. So the Aquaterra water bank has a storage capacity of 800,000 acre feet. This is just a fraction of the 1.8 million acre feet of storage available under MAGSA. 
there's an estimated 208,000 acre feet of annual recharge capacity, which has been which has an estimated conveyance for the project of 770 cubic feet per second. It is assumed that the water will be recharged from October through March. The extraction capacity of 480 cubic feet per second results in an extraction capacity of 146,000 acre feet per year. It is assumed that this water will be extracted May through September. There are five conveyance facilities for the recharge and recovery. The conveyance facilities are connected to allow water to move around MAGSA. Two of the conveyance facilities would be used to run extractions back to the Mendota pool. Next slide. So this provides a map that shows the conveyance facilities in MAGSA, as well as the purple dots are the pump stations. So the MAGSA groundwater bank infrastructure will consist of recharge basins, recovery wells, canal conveyance, pump stations, and monitoring wells. There's approximately 4,000 acre, total acres of recharge. This is comprised into five separate areas <clears throat> identified in the yellow boxes. The recharge sites are on the east side of MAGSA because of the better soils for recharge and better groundwater quality. To return water to the Mendota pool, there are about 90 recovery wells with the majority of the recovery wells located in sites four and five, since those are the larger areas. So there are five main canals. The first one is the orange line, which is the Jensen Canal. This is one of the canals connected to the Mendota pool. And the general topography of MAGSA is it's uphill going north and east. So when we recharge water, it'll be pumped to the east. And when water is recovered, it'll be by gravity to the west. The second canal is the James alignment, which parallels the James bypass, it's a light blue line, and then follows the American Avenue east to the east side of MAGSA. We also have the east side canal, which is the dark blue line, which runs along the eastern edge of MAGSA and connects the five recharge areas. Then there's McMullen phase one and McMullen expansion that Phil has already talked about. That's the green and the purple line. And then there's the Siski canal, which is the red line that goes north. So there's a total of 65 miles of bi-directional conveyance canals and there will be approximately 25 pump stations. The pump stations will be standardized for 12 feet of lift, which provides MAGSA simpler operations and maintenance. And there will be a groundwater monitoring com committee, which would allow water bank partners to provide input onto the bank operations. And now I'll hand it over to Rain to discuss the Reclamation Federal Action. Great, thank you. So um, Reclamation's federal action associated with the uh, MAGSA project involves uh, potential acknowledgement of the uh, proposed groundwater bank pursuant to the Central Valley Project Improvement Act um, and um, certain federal contracts. Um, thank you, Rain. With that, I would like to describe uh, the environmental review process the Aquaterra Water Bank project has both state and federal involvement. <clears throat> Therefore, it's being evaluated under both state and federal regulations. State of California review falls under CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act, and federal re review falls under NEPA, which is the, Envi the National Environmental Policy Act. These processes are similar enough that a project can be evaluated under both statutes in a single document. For CEQA compliance, MAGSA is preparing an initial study, and for NEPA, the Bureau of Reclamation is preparing an environmental assessment. These evaluations are being combined into a single joint document. Both of these studies are intended to determine if the project may result in significant impacts that cannot be mitigated to less than significant. If the project could result in significant unmitigable impacts, then the lead agencies may make the determination to prepare an environmental impact report under CEQA and an environmental impact statement under NEPA. If all impacts are less than significant or can be mitigated to less than significant, MAGSA will prepare a mitigated negative de declaration for CEQA 
And the Bureau of Reclamation will prepare a finding of no significant impact or FONSI for NEPA. On the next slide, we'll describe a, a bit of the, the, the goals of NEPA and CEQA. NEPA and CEQA are intended to both identify potential impacts to environmental, cultural, and social resources, and to inform the public of potential impacts. Both processes allow for and encourage public participation in the environmental review process. In this case, opportunities for public involvement include the scoping period, which is happening now, and the public comment period, which occurs when the draft environmental documents are released for public review. On the next slide, we'll discuss a few of the resources that we're considering. Uh, this list um, is, um, is indicative of some of the primary areas of, of concern for a project of this nature and in this location. Under NEPA and CEQA, we will be evaluating approximately 15 distinct resource types. Um, the, the list here, uh, as I said, are some of the primary areas of concern. So to, to make sure that we have the, the proper data and, and all the information needed to fully evaluate effects to some of these resources, uh, there are a number of, um, of studies uh, that are being implemented. Uh, we were performing air quality, uh, air quality modeling in accordance with the requirements of the San Joaquin Valley Air Resources Board. We are performing a, a, a cultural resources investigation. Uh, we have a, um, a registered archaeologist on our team who is performing uh, database searches and, uh, and reconnaissance level ground uh, surveys to determine the potential for, uh, for protected cultural resources. We have um, uh, access past studies that show that, there, that a project like this results in no effects on crop health or yields. And we are evaluating land uses to make sure that, um, that uh, the existing land uses would not be altered and that, uh, that future land uses are consistent with, uh, with ongoing practices. The land use evaluation is also intended to show that the project will not divide existing communities. This project is designed to result in no net loss of soils. All excavated soils will be deposited on adjacent uh, adjacent fields and redistributed by, by landowners. Also, the low velocities and high compaction of the conveyance features are intended to minimize loss of uh, a soil due to erosion. NEPA and CEQA documents <clears throat> assess the project's consistency with environmental regulations, land use policies, and socioeconomic regulations uh, to evaluate and report any possible effects on such um, uh, on, on protected resources. In the next slide, we'll uh, discuss scoping a bit. Scoping is the process whereby a project proponent or lead agency informs the public of a proposed project and invites the public to provide comments on the scope of the environmental analysis and the issues of most concern to members of the public. Scoping is required for preparation of an environmental impact report or an environmental impact statement. Although scoping is not required for preparation of an initial study or an environmental assessment as we're preparing in this phase, MAGSA and the Bureau of Reclamation made the decision to hold a public scoping period in recognition of the diverse community of stakeholders, public agencies, and other members of the public who may have an interest in this project. Your feedback is important to us and will be considered as we prepare these documents. Members of the public are free to comment on any topic of concern to them during this process. Some of the general topics that are commonly addressed with scoping comments are shown on this slide. For example, um, are there concerns? Sometimes people ask if there are concerns with the possible outcomes of the project. Will the project operate as it's intended to? And it's incumbent upon the, uh, the environmental documentation to show that this project has gone through sufficient design, that there is high level of confidence in the possible outcome. People often ask, what are the most important environmental concerns? And is there any controversy associated with this project? 
And uh, uh, frequently people ask, uh, what other environmental laws apply? And we will cover all of those items in the uh, NEPA and CEQA document. For example, other environmental laws that, uh, that apply and are an integral part of the evaluation process uh, include the Clean Water Act, the, um, the Clean Air Act, the Endangered Species Act, uh, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and numerous other federal and state, uh, federal, state, and local regulations. So uh, the public scoping period opened on November 3rd and will close on December 3rd. So please submit your comments by then. We intend to have a draft NEPA CEQA document ready for public review and comment by late winter or early spring of 2022. The release of the draft environmental document will kick off a 30 day public comment period. The public comment period will be publicized in a similar manner to the scoping period. Following the public comment period, MAGSA and the Bureau will address your comments and prepare a final initial study environmental assessment. It will include either a mitigated negative declaration and FONSI or a recommendation to prepare additional environmental documentation. We intend to complete this phase of the environmental review process in late spring of 2022. With that, I will hand the meeting over to Rebecca, who will provide you with information on how to submit comments and stay informed over the course of the project. Rebecca? Great. So uh, David said it, he mentioned that your feedback is important. So I just want to reiterate that we want you, the public, to stay engaged with the Aquaterra Water Bank Project. Um, you can find more information for the project on the Bureau of Reclamation's website. It's at the link listed here on this slide. Um, and just so you know, the slides will be posted on the MAGSA website tomorrow, and we'll share them to our email list. So you can view those slides and click the Bureau link directly from the slide. So don't feel like you have to rush to write it down or type it out. Um, we'll have that available for you. And speaking of our email list, the fastest way to stay up to date is by uh, signing up for email. So if you sign up, you'll receive meeting notices, project updates, and more information on MAGSA's work on projects within the area. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, but I'll go ahead and say it again, you can sign up at our website, mcmullenarea.org, or if you wanna drop your name and email in the Q&A box, uh, we'll personally make sure that you're added to the list. And we are also active on social media. If you'd like to stay up to date that way, we post different updates, articles, videos, and more. And I uh, hope you'll give us a follow to stay in touch. And we are active on YouTube as well. And that's where this recording will be posted. Next slide, please, Crystal. Thanks. Uh, if you'd like to contact us uh, directly on the project, you can contact Rain Emerson with the Bureau of Reclamation uh, by the phone number or email list on the slide. You can see also uh, Matt Hurley, MAGS's GM, his contact information is also on the slide. They would both be excellent resources on this project for you to contact. So the comment period for the water bank scoping session began on November 3rd and will conclude on December 3rd. So as we've mentioned, uh, we will be taking comments this evening via the Q&A feature. So now and anytime during this 30-day comment period, you can submit your comments a number of ways. So if you don't have a comment tonight, but you think of something later, or if you just have a question, we have other ways that you can do that. Um, so we want to make it as convenient as possible for you to engage with us, however you're most comfortable. So you can do that by email, either to Reclamation or to MAGSA. Uh, you can also submit comments by mail to the reclamation office at the address listed, or you can mail or hand deliver to MAGSA's office in Kerman. Um, if you plan to hand deliver to the MAGSA office, uh, please do so during business hours, and you'll probably get a good chat with Madden if you do it that way. Um, so submitting questions, comments tonight, if you'd like to submit a question or comment, um, you can do so by hovering your mouse over the bottom of your screen. You'll see your Zoom menu will uh, pop up and you can select the Q&A button and just go ahead and type your question or comment and hit send. We'll see that comment. Um, we'll see the question, read your question out loud and go ahead and respond live. So 
Uh, David, if, if you're in agreement, we can go ahead and open up the, the floor for questions and comments from the public. I'm in agreement. Thank you. Okay, so I see we have a question. Um, will the project include facilities to bank water from the Frank Kern Canal and return water to the Frank Kern Canal? Thank you for your question. I'm going to let Matt address that question. Thank you. The answer is that, the, of course, the geography of the, the layout of the Frank Kern Canal and its distance from the, the McMullen Area Groundwater Sustainability Agency Bank uh, will make the physical transfer of water unlikely. But what we'll find in the operation of a, of a standard water bank is that many times the, uh, the puts and the takes to the water bank, the deposits and withdrawals often occur by way of exchange. And so a, a contract uh, water rights holder in the, say in the Frank Kern with water in Millerton uh, could enter into a, an exchange agreement with another contractor uh, or with a, a, a exchange partner. And we could deliver water say to the Mendota pool for further delivery or, uh, you know, or other, other ways, but a direct connection is not envisioned to the Frank Kern. Uh, along that same line, the, you know, the San Joaquin River and the Kings River, you know, when they're available, could, could be utilized as direct connections for deposits, but uh, withdrawals, direct withdrawals would have to be by exchange. Thank you, Matt. Don't be shy. <laughs> there must be questions. There's 42, 42 people here. Let's uh, let's let's get some. No such thing as a dumb question, by the way. Within reason. All right, David, another question. How is surface water being delivered to the project if groundwater is the only water supply for MAGSA? Matt, I'm gonna ask you to address this one to begin with and uh, we'll see if um, uh, Lynn has anything else to add. Yeah, right. If, uh, you know, we did go fairly quickly through the, the charts and maps that we have, but we, uh, we are uh, proposing to make outside deliveries, so imports to MAGSA, uh, either from uh, direct connections that we envision uh, on the Mendota Pool or the Kings River at the, at the bypass, or ultimately uh, down the line, perhaps uh, directly off the uh, San Joaquin River, which uh, is adjacent to MAGSA on its northern edge. So um, that, you know, it will be a matter of, of uh, state and federal contractors availing themselves of the uh, the facilities, which are the San Luis Reservoir, the O'Neill Four Bay, the Delta Mendota Canal, and other uh, ancillary delivery conveyances that already exist in addition to the rivers to get the water to MAGSA and back out of MAGSA again for ultimate delivery. Yeah, and I'll add, currently it's groundwater only because there's no, besides the McMullen phase one, there's no surface water facilities within MAGSA that's going to change. So next year we'll start construction of the McMullen expansion project. And then the rest of the canals will be built after that. So once we get the infrastructure in place, we'll be able to divert surface water and bring it into MAGSA. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Lynn. All right, so we have another question here. Is there a larger scale map and project description available than what is shown in the presentation? That answer is simple, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, those are available for review in the office. Uh, if you put in a request, we'll make sure we get some uh, sent out directly to you and you can, uh, you can blow it up on your, on your screen any, to the extent that you need to. We'll, we'll be happy to provide uh, additional maps and drawings of the project as it moves along. Thank you, Matt. Sure. 
Okay, another question. What is the cost for participation in Aquaterra? Is participation in the groundwater bank allocated in blocks? For example, blocks of 5,000 acre feet or 10,000 acre feet? Well, I'll jump on that one quickly. Um, Alan, the, the, uh, the anticipation here is that we will provide a, a, a priority group. That's the 800,000 acre feet that Lynn described earlier. Uh, in exchange uh, for uh, an acre foot of, of water in the uh, perpetual right to store water uh, on an acre foot basis within MAGSA <clears throat> will be determined by a subscription agreement. Uh, that'll come up with a fixed price for that, uh, for that right, uh, that priority right to, to bank and remove water from MAGSA. And of course the other 1.6 to 1.8, uh, or 1.2 to 1.4 million acre feet of water uh, will be available through other means by um, by puts and takes of uneven exchange, perhaps five in, four out, uh, those kinds of things. So there'll be a, a variety of ways that uh, an entity or a, or a, a participant can um, can uh, make arrangements with Mags to store water, uh, you know, now and into the future. But our our main purpose here is to describe for you the the eight hundred thousand feet of of a primary storage that we're offering on a priority basis to what will be our priority partners who will functionally uh, pay for the, the cost of the improvements to make the water bank work. All right, so another question. Can you speak to the proposed monitoring system to evaluate mm -hmm. natural losses of water from water banks associated with horizontal groundwater flow? Yes, we can. Uh, you're not the first person to ask a question like that. The interesting circumstance with uh, with the King Subbasin specifically uh, and MAGSA as part of that King Subbasin is it's uh, where MAGSA sits is effectively the, if you can imagine, the deep end of a swimming pool. And so uh, we have a, a, a unique uh, hydrogeology that, um, that uh, rests below us that really doesn't allow for the water to disperse like it may in some flatter storage facilities. And so what we expect is for uh, most, if not all of that water to remain underneath MAGSA's boundary uh, until such time as we fill up the current void, which is estimated to be between 1.8 and 2 million acre feet. So it'll be a nice problem to have when we get there, but uh, we should have a full water bank before we have uh, any concerns about water uh, leaking out and, and heading other places. So there won't be a uh, a horizontal water fl flow necessarily coming out of MAGSA because of the subsurface hydrogeology that we, we have the, the good fortune of sitting over. All right, we have a couple more questions in the queue. So I'll go ahead and move ahead. Uh, the next question is, it appears that this project is dependent upon Kings River water. Do you have rights to divert Kings River water? As we indicated prior, uh, the, the McMullen area has no surface water rights. It's a groundwater only area. Uh, what we are planning for relative to Kings River water would be uh, uh, flood flows, which would be in excess of the, of the water rights requirements to meet uh, the, the water rights holders demands on the Kings River. Uh, we're pretty far down the river. And so most everybody on the Kings River has an opportunity to uh, take as much water as they can possibly use on the Kings River flows uh, uh, before it gets to us. And it's only in those, uh, those occasions where we have uh, excess flood water moving by us that we'd be banking that water. And then uh, the, the rest of the project is dependent upon uh, state and federal contract water, which uh, works under an entirely different regime. Okay, great. Next question is, who are your priority partners and how does someone become a priority partner? Well, we, we have not, um, because of the fact that we're in our environmental review and we don't have uh, ourselves uh, developed to the point where we could finalize that commitment yet, uh, we don't have any priority partners currently, but we're in conversation with uh, several different water agencies uh, around the state, all of whom are either uh, state or federal water contractors at this point in time who have an interest in long-term storage for droughts, just like the one we're, we're experiencing right now. So uh, we have uh, a substantial number. We've conducted a, 
Uh, we actually conducted a tour about a year ago. It was a, it was a fun time, even in light of the, of the um, pandemic, where we brought folks in and were able to drive them around and show them our proposed facilities and locations and so on. And that, uh, that was a great opportunity for them to, to learn more about our proposed water bank. And those conversations continue uh, right up to the, uh, I had one today, as a matter of fact. So it's ongoing. Someone becomes a priority partner simply by, by contacting uh, MAGSA and, and, and starting the conversation. We have an open door for uh, anybody and everybody who uh, would like to store water here. It's most likely going to come through an agency. I can be honest with you, it's not necessarily someone, uh, an individual per se, although that's not prohibited, uh, but likely uh, the best thing if you're an individual landowner will be to contact uh, your primary water agency and talk about uh, a connection to MAGSA through the primary water agency. Right, great. So um, William is asking a follow-up. He asked the question about the groundwater flow. Um, he'd like to know, how did you evaluate this watertight basin? Well, um, <clears throat> we've, we as a Kings River subbasin or the King subbasin, <clears throat> excuse me, um, have worked the coordination agreement out. We've done subsurface studies. We've had uh, experts uh, assess the flow of water within the subbasin. And uh, the conclusion is fairly clear that uh, we have, as we described previously, uh, some, some areas below our boundary, which uh, have uh, essentially become void of water due to overpumping over the last hundred years. Uh, we have the, also the good fortune of uh, not having a, a serious subsidence issue on, on the east side of the river, which is where MAGSA sits. And so virtually what we have is uh, a full understanding of the last hundred years that the, the area has gone from uh, one of being a, a, of, of uh, uh, you know, a slough, a fres part of the Fresno slough and, and having high groundwater levels to low groundwater levels without subsidence. And so we believe that that has effectively created a, a vault, uh, if, you, you know, if you can imagine one that is, re that is uh, waiting to be refilled again. And so that's how we've concluded that. Uh, from our hydro and, and geological studies. <clears throat> okay, so he has to follow up. Um, so I'm gonna jump down to that one, but I'll get back to you other two questions on hold. Um, but he'd like to know specifically, will there be a monitoring system? Of course, uh, and, and one of the things that, uh, going back to McMullen's groundwater sustainability plan, <clears throat> we've, uh, we've adopted a series of policies, including a, a metering and measurement policy. And so it's our intention uh, during the, the operation of this water bank to monitor uh, a complete grid across the MAGSA area to determine if there is uh, uh, any uh, outflows that we had not predicted. And so, yes, we'll be monitoring uh, from the surface and in the sub subsurface, uh, all the act activities that occur relative to the water bank on both puts and takes to make sure there's no negative impacts and we can identify uh, how the flows are progressing. Okay, great. So I'm gonna jump back up to the next question in the queue. Um, so when pumping the water into the conveyance channels, what would be the water quality such as TDS and boron? Well, we've, we've done uh, as part of our feasibility study for the water bank, we've, uh, We've done some soil borings. We've determined uh, what the water quality is likely to be like in the areas that we plan on doing the recharge and extraction. Uh, we're aware of the subsurface uh, uh, aggregation of those particular types of uh, constituents. And uh, we have identified specifically and limited some of our recharge to areas which do not have those constituents present. The TDS is obviously a different issue than the boron. Uh, the TDS is one that we believe uh, uh, that there'll be a, <clears throat> a general mixing of waters below MAGS as the water bank uh, gains, <clears throat> gains additional deposits, and uh, that will result in actually a reduction in TDS. We have some, some salts down in the, on the western edges of the district that uh, we believe will be diluted as a result of some of the, the waters coming into the MAGSA water bank. High, high interest in water quality on a water bank, especially our water bank, uh, because we are next to the Mendota pool and, 
and a lot of people rely on that. So it's our it's our intention to uh, to always try to put water back into the the pool on subsequent delivery that's of greater quality than came out when it was delivered to to, to Magsa. Okay, so another question on the Kings River. Uh, so if you intend to only use flood waters on the Kings, does that mean you will never make a claim to Kings water? Well, uh, that particular question is a great one, but uh, we never know what the future might hold. And uh, I probably even know who the anonymous attendee is, but I'll just answer the question. But uh, uh, that's not a subject of conversation in this particular presentation. <laughs> All right, so next question is Aquaterra is pursuing CVP acknowledgement. Can the water bank also deliver and recover SWP water as well? Yes, the, the reason, well, perhaps the rain would like to chime in, but the, the, the Central Valley Project and the Bureau of Reclamation do have a, a process <clears throat> that, uh, that we are following in order to do a full analysis as to whether or not uh, they will be able to do that acknowledgement and, and that certification. Uh, under the uh, State Water Project, of course, we're doing a CEQA review and there is no, uh, there's no similar or, or parallel acknowledgement that the state does, uh, but we will be accomplishing all of the uh, other regulatory review, et cetera, that's required for us to set up a water bank in the state of California, of course, and in the, in the county of Fresno for that matter. All right, so will there be a maximum time that deposits will be left in the bank? Um, that will be something that was mentioned briefly uh, during the presentation that we will have a, an operations committee. <clears throat> and I think as we do the monitoring, as we do the deposits, and as time goes by, uh, that'll be a, you know, excuse my, the pun, it'll be a fluid analysis that, that, that uh, follows the, uh, the deposits and withdrawals, and it may be subject to some time limitations, but at this stage of the game, uh, we don't have any preconception about how long the water uh, can be left in the water bank. Okay, next question is, what other models of water banks are there? How are we similar and how are we different? There are. Uh, in, the, in Kern County, uh, Kern County is sort of the, the, uh, the, the ground zero for development of water banks in the state of California, uh, and they're fully operable now. They've been built and operated for some time. Uh, the, generally, the, um, the differences would be in the subsurface soils and, and permeability and the ability of, of, of water to permeate or percolate into the, into the subsurface. Um, down there, it's a, it's a different set of soils than it is up here, uh, but we do have uh, uh, a, a, a slightly, the, I think a previous question was about the, the tightness of, the, of the, uh, the basin here. We do have a, a little tighter uh, basin here than there is perhaps in, in uh, Kern County, but it's generally distinguished by location as much as anything else. But water banks are relatively new concept within the state, you know, 20, 25, 30 years old. So uh, we are attempting to improve on that mousetrap as we go forward and try to, to bring the most up-to-date and, and current water banking facility available in, in the state when we complete our water bank. Okay, so the next question is, why is a local groundwater sustainability agency proposing to build a massive groundwater bank for the benefit of distant state and federal contractors. I feel like I'm in a tug of war with the anonymous attendee, but um, a local groundwater sustainability agency, of course, is proposing a water bank for the, for the benefit of uh, the distant state and federal contractors so that they will have a place to store their water. There will be a leave behind associated with the banking and so uh, the, the GSA, the Groundwater Sustainability Agency, and the basin will, uh, will have an increase in their water supply as a result of our operating water bank. So uh, not only is it benefiting MAGSA landowners proper, but it will also be benefiting the, uh, the, the other partners that we have, uh, other GSAs within the sub-basin and the sub-basin in general as we uh, 
as we uh, try to get to sustainability at the earliest possible date. So a water bank will provide a great deal of benefit to our local area as a result of the state and federal contractors wishing to participate with us and us storing their water for them for future use. Okay, so follow up question uh, says your refusal to answer the above question indicates that you may want to make a claim to King's water in the future. Presumes facts not in evidence, as they say in the in the legal world. No, that's not the wasn't the answer to my question. I said it's not a scope, part of the scope of this particular conversation, and uh, I'm not at liberty to disclose one way or the other what my board of directors or my landowners may have a plan for the future. Next question, how does the Aquaterra groundwater bank address the historic uh, significant unsustainable groundwater pumping in MAGSA? Well, um, the, the whole purpose of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was to provide methodology by which all of the groundwater overdraft that exists within the state of California can be addressed. <clears throat> MAGSA's area is pretty steady in its groundwater pumping. And so uh, uh, it, it may or may not be sustainable, but it is our intention uh, to operate the water bank as a, a project that will in fact increase uh, the, the recharge and the replacement of the water so that we reach that sustainable uh, level and we expect that the water bank will, will, will go a long ways in making that happen. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it addresses it by uh, reaching sustainability within the parameter set up by the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. All right, next question is, will leave behinds be variable and negotiable by participant or standardized for all participants? Right now, we have not uh, projected so far ahead as to know what kind of tiers we'll be dealing with. As we talked about, the 800,000 acre feet will be for the initial priority banking uh, partners. <clears throat> their, their, uh, their leave behinds will generally be standardized for at least that 800,000 acre feet uh, of, uh, of that tier. We'll have subsequent tiers of participants where we expect that uh, those leave behinds can be negotiable uh, depending upon the ability to, for some of those folks to pay uh, either the operating expenses uh, associated with their deposits and they can, they can exchange with MAGSA for water or for, or for fees. And so those will be negotiable uh, at each of the tiers once they're established. They're not established now, but would be anticipated in the future uh, that that would all be negotiated at least in a tiered arrangement for the operation of the water bank. Right. So next question is, will landowners be able to use water from the water bank over the 10% leave behind? Not sure exactly if that, I'm, I'm going to presume that question means that um, the, the, it, will the landowners be able to use the water that is left behind? The whole purpose of the leave behind is to provide for some losses and also to provide uh, some water for ultimately for offsetting uh, the overdraft that was mentioned by one of the previous questions uh, until we get to a point where we're sustainable. Uh, our allocation system that will be established in the future in MAGSA will take all of this, including these water supplies into account when we do an allocation, but that has, we have not reached that point as yet. So the answer is likely yes, but um, depending on the tiers that I described in the last question, uh, there'll be more or less leave behind than the 10%. Looks like we have a bit of a lull. We can wait. Got to have a little flurry there. That was good. Yeah, you can take a drink of water, Matt. <laughs> yeah. We did this in our last scoping session. We had we had little flurries, and we got some more. So, as you're sitting there uh, watching, please uh, formulate a question. And let us uh, let us answer it if we can. Okay, you didn't get Alan, that long Alan, of a break. Alan's got, some, <laughs> Alan's got some great questions. Um, Ab, Alan, the question is, do you expect the 800,000 acre feet to be fully subscribed? The answer is absolutely. 
uh, I'm hoping that uh, we'll have all 1.8 to 2 million acre feet subscribed in some way, shape, or form uh, as we develop this water bank, and that we uh, we can have that water, uh, the leave behind water, serve to to uh, retire the overdraft in the King Sub Basin at the earliest possible date. So yes, we fully expect the 800,000 to be subscribed to. All right, Matt, what type of fees will be charged for water bank storage? Generally, generally, we try to operate the water bank um, so that it's a cost neutral arrangement, it's a zero sum. So what will likely happen is that there will be operations and maintenance charges that will be agreed upon with the committee for the, the priority storage and uh, through uh, other committees for MAGSA operations that will come up with uh, uh, reasonable charges that will offset the costs. Some of the costs associated with operating a water bank obviously are maintenance of our conveyance structures, maintenance of our lift stations, um, paying the cost of the energy necessary to operate our, our lift pumps on the canals, uh, obviously the personnel involved in making all this happen. So we'll, we'll run a budget, an annual budget that uh, will be agreed upon uh, on an annual basis and, and each of the partners will pay a pro rata share of those fees for the storage so that it uh, results in a net uh, break even for the operation of the bank uh, for our landowners. It won't cost our landowners, landowners anything within MAGS so specifically. All right, so where is the interest in Aquaterra coming from? <clears throat> North of Delta agencies, local agencies, any others? Um, I, I would say that if I were to, to generalize where most of the interest is coming from, it's mostly south of Delta. We are, you know, we're located geographically in a spot uh, that we're going to get a high amount of interest from south of Delta contractors. Uh, and we, we geographically sit, as we showed on the map, they're kind of in the center of the state. Uh, we anticipate that the operation of this water bank will, will largely benefit probably, um, you know, Delta South uh, agencies to the greatest degree. Uh, you know, the Northern California folks don't have much of necessarily much of an interest in storing water in the center or the southern part of California. So it's usually a, a water management concern for the storage rather than, uh, uh, you know, water operations over, over the long term for Northern California. Great questions. Excellent questions. We should have some like elevator music or something we can put on there and, and play while we're watching or the, or the <laughs> Jeopardy, Jeopardy music. <laughs> Matt, usually with you around, you know, we figure we don't need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't done, I haven't gotten up on my desk and start tap dancing yet. So I guess that's a good thing. <laughs> no, I'm actually really enjoying the questions. I think they're very, they show a high degree of, uh, of uh, interest by the participants, which I, uh, I'm very appreciative of. Right, another question. Will minimum thresholds curtail recovery if they are reached during a drop period and recovery, recovery requests from the groundwater bank <clears throat> remain strong? Well, as I indicated before, the, and, and Lynn did in her presentation, she described a, a, a input capacity for specifically the 800,000 acre feet uh, primary partners of about uh, 200 are there about a thousand acre feet of input, whereas the, the withdrawal is anticipated to be in the 140 to 150,000 acre foot uh, maximum capacity area. Uh, if we have, uh, obviously before one can withdraw, one must deposit. And so if we're maintaining 
the proper records and maintaining the proper ratio of deposits to withdrawals, uh, we should not reach a situation where the withdrawals would co cause a, a acceleration of uh, overdraft in our area, which would cause our minimum thresholds to be approached. So um, it's, a, it's probably kind of a fringe question. I suppose it's possible that it could be reached at some point, but it's highly unlikely that, that the scenario presented in this question would ever be a, a worry in the, in the operation of the water bank. Everybody's still here. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> here we go. All right. It appears that your project is dependent upon water supplies from other agencies. Do you currently have agreements with those agencies to supply water? Uh, as indicated previously, our conversations continue with our potential partners. Uh, we are getting uh, very close to uh, uh, entering into specific contracts for um, subscriptions to our water bank. But as of this moment, uh, it's just slightly premature. We would like to get a little further along in our environmental just to make sure we have something uh, to agree upon before we make agreements. I have this urge to whistle. I don't know why I'm not going to start whistling. So <laughs> you guys don't want that. <laughs> All right, Matt, when does MAGSA expect to start signing participation contracts? Uh, as I indicated, I think we're looking for, uh, we're looking for some you know, initial inputs off the environmental. As soon as that occurs and it looks like we're in, in pretty good shape, uh, um, you know, we, uh, you know, we'll begin to execute those agreements probably in the, in the foreseeable future here over the next couple of months, I imagine. <clears throat> and, I, and I will fill in for you, Rebecca, and I'll keep reminding them that uh, as much as I like answering this, these questions this evening, uh, everybody jokes about me. I'm willing to talk to you about this water bank just about any time, anywhere. So make sure you avail yourselves of either my emails or my phone number and uh, give me a holler if you feel a little sheepish about asking questions on, online here. I'll be happy to chat with you uh, on the telephone or if you do a drop in uh, anytime about this water bank. Okay, Matt. Other than environmental, what is the role of the Bureau of Reclamation? Are they project partners? Uh, no, not specifically. Uh, of course, they are in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense, always our partners in, in working on this. Uh, their concern, of course, is with the CVP contractors who will be involved. And of course, their oversight role is important to make sure that uh, that CVP water and those contracts uh, are observed, honored, and uh, are, are uh, complied with uh, to the maximum extent uh, possible. So uh, they are a partner in our, uh, in our reaching uh, that status in, in making sure that we dot I's and cross T's, definitely. And Rain, feel free to jump in there if you need to add on top of that. Sure, um, I was thinking I, I might clarify our, our role as soon as I can figure out how to work the system. <laughs> There we go. So reclamations, our role is limited to just the acknowledgement of the bank at this point, um, which would allow, if it were to be acknowledged, it would allow Central Valley Project Water to be put into the bank by contractors, should they choose to. At that point, if it were Central Valley Project contractors that wanted to, to bank, they would come to reclamation requesting approval to do so, and we would do additional environmental review and analysis on that particular proposal. Um, but the bank has to become acknowledged first. Um, so our role right now at this point is just limited to the potential acknowledgement of the bank. 
Perfect. Okay, Matt. Will Aquaterra be a phased construction? Example, 500 acres with recovery and conveyance in 2025, 1,000 acres with recovery and conveyance by 2030, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it will be, uh, well, it won't be a phased construction. It's not, it's not planned to be that type of phasing. Uh, what we expect on our current timeline is uh, if everything remains according to our plan, we'll complete this environmental review. We will uh, be finishing up our um, working drawings on the facilities to be constructed. Of course, we'll be ordering our appropriate capital equipment in the form of uh, pumps and motors and, and uh, infrastructure, et cetera. <clears throat> but as, as we have it laid out right now, we hope to be at least sufficiently complete uh, with our construction to be able to take the first deposits uh, by our banking partners in the 2023-2024 winter period. And then uh, our first returns of those deposits, of course, as I indicated before, uh, this operates like a financial bank. You have to make deposits in order to make withdrawals. And we would expect that the first withdrawals, we will have the sufficient uh, infrastructure in place to be able to supply the first with withdrawals the following year in the 2024-2025 timeline. So it's a fairly aggressive uh, approach uh, with the, the obvious pain that all of us are feeling relative to the drought. <clears throat> it's our sincere interest to try to get this water bank up and operational so that uh, the next time there's a flood or a drought, uh, that uh, we minimize the effects of the drought and maximize the ability for recharging during the flood so that we can uh, get a better balance and better management of the water supply in the area at the earliest possible convenience. So uh, that's the plan on how to get to that. Okay, we have a special request for Rain. Rain, <laughs> when do you expect to have your environmental review completed? I mean, so I think as indicated earlier, we're doing a joint NEPA CEQA document. And so the scoping obviously is a big part of that where we're trying to get feedback from the public and we'll use that as part of, um, to help develop the, the analysis alternatives for the project. I think that um, the schedule that the consultants were looking at was early spring, was it February or March that I was sitting on our schedule as they were thinking of having a draft um, EAIS out for public review. Um, assuming the project goes as we, um, as, as it may, and, and again, we're, we're not trying to be pre you know, we're, we're developing an EA to start to take a look at, are there any potentially significant um, impacts that we might need to look at, might need to do an EIS for or not. Um, so to answer your question, I don't know, 100% know exactly when we're going to be done, but I would anticipate um, sometime in 2022, we should be done, depending on what the resources end up being and, you know, comments on the, on the, from the public on the draft documents and how long that might take to address. Um, I don't know, um, Rebecca or Matt or David <laughs> on the terms of this timeline, at least estimated at this point. So the, the timeline you discussed, Rain, is pretty consistent with what we have in the schedule so far and what we put on the screen earlier. Um, and as Rain said, that is assuming that um, you know everything goes according to plan, that we don't uh, necessarily identify any significant and unmitigable impacts, uh, or that we need to do additional studies to uh, to document any of the um, any of the potentially affected resources. But at this point, um, we do anticipate that uh, public uh, public review will occur in late winter or early spring of 2022, and um, that we will have a um, a, a final draft uh, document um, in our hands um, in uh, in late spring of 20, uh, 2022. Okay. And also, I'm I'm sorry, Rebecca. One more okay. one more thing. Um, and as Rain was uh, was was mentioning, um, at that point we will be looking at the at the effects and um, that are identified in the initial study and uh, and environmental assessment and uh, determining if the uh, impacts are uh, sufficiently mitigated or if there are remaining significant impacts and whether uh, if additional environmental evaluation will need to occur at that point. Thank you. All right. 
So next question is, will the bank affect the San Joaquin River restoration settlement in any way? I think the answer to that is it's, it's, it's not set up to affect the San Joaquin River restoration settlement at all necessarily. <clears throat> I think just personally, I think that uh, with the bank being developed and its geolocation, uh, it may in fact provide additional uh, assistance for the, uh, the successful implementation of the settlement uh, that might not have been considered when the settlement was made. So for example, uh, we may be able to, uh, you know, seek the, the uh, advice of the San Joaquin River Restoration Project as to whether or not they think that, you know, accessing our bank for storage for purposes of operating uh, the San Joaquin River in the future may be beneficial. And we hope that uh, that, that will be the case and that uh, the existence of the water bank will be helpful in, uh, in, in reaching successful uh, San Joaquin River Restoration. Okay, the next question is, in order for the bank to be developed and functional to store and recover water, does the full 800,000 acre feet need to be subscribed for? What would happen if some partners dropped out, for example, and only a portion of the facilities could be developed? Well, as with anything, nothing's guaranteed. Um, this this 800,000 acre foot um, priority storage uh, capability is in the scheme of things right now with other water banking projects being proposed in sites, reservoir and other storage facilities, it, uh, it tends to be on the less expensive range of, of, uh, of, the, of the scale. And so we fully expect that not only will we, we fully subscribe our 800,000 acre feet of priority, but we may in fact have those who uh, essentially will be uh, on standby in case any of the, uh, the partners ha have a need to to uh, not complete their obligation. Uh, if, in, you know, since we're relying on our priority partners effectively to, to finance the construction, clearly if we needed to, we would have to get supplemental financing to fill a gap if one uh, were to occur, but we don't anticipate that right now. The interest is sufficient, at least strong at this point where we believe that uh, we should reach uh, the full 800,000 acre foot subscription uh, early on in the process. Okay, the next question is, will this proposed project and environmental document be similar to the McMullen on-farm flood capture ISMND from March 2016? I will allow the environmental experts to answer that question. <clears throat> so the environmental documentation uh, released in 2016 was for phase one of the McMullen projects, which was a much smaller project than what we are anticipating here. Um, the similarities though, are that it was an initial, the, the, the phase one project was evaluated under an, an, under an initial study and the, the Aquaterra water bank project is also being evaluated under an initial study under CEQA. So uh, those, from that standpoint, the project, the, the evaluation is similar. What is different is that um, the evaluation that we're conducting now is, is more robust. It's, uh, there's, there's more evaluation of groundwater or potential groundwater effects. Um, there's more public involvement because the, the project is just uh, by necessity much larger. So um, there, are, there are similarities in the process, but in the, um, uh, in the production of the documents, there are, there are fairly, large, um, fairly large differences. The other aspect is that uh, for the 2016 document, there was not federal involvement. So it was only a CEQA project, a CEQA evaluation. In this instance, there's both uh, uh, state and federal involvement. So the document that'll be released will also have um, uh, the required components of, a, of NEPA documentation. Thank you. Okay, great. Next question is, will Aquaterra have to make separate upper and lower aquifer banking deposits? Does the Corcoran clay underlie the proposed water bank footprint and does it affect the surface water deposits made by participants? 
The answer to that is fairly simple. Um, well, there's it's a multi-part multi -part question, so let me answer the obvious first. Uh, the entirety of the MAGSA boundary area, the entire uh, operating area for MAGSA, sits above the Corcoran clay. We have uh, the unique that unique characteristic that uh, separates us from our partners and our and our uh, other fellow GSAs in the King Subbasin to our east, with the exception of the James uh, GSA and a portion of the North Fork Kings GSA, uh, we are the only areas that, that are that are completely over underlain by the Corcoran clay. Now as to the, the deposits being made into the upper or the unconfined or the lower confined aquifer, it's our intention to operate the Aquaterra water bank entirely in the unconfined upper aquifer and to not make any uh, deposits below the Corcoran clay. Okay, so next question. Will we be applying for federal and or state grants for the project? Well, this is one of my favorite people in, uh, in MAGS, and so I'm going to give her the answer that I would give her if she was sitting in front of me. Uh, we will always be applying for federal and state grants for our projects, and we'll continue to do so. Um, stand by for some, some really good information from our Crack outreach team as we begin to announce the fact that we just received a couple of uh, fantastic grant awards and we continue to apply for additional grant awards. So for this and all of our projects, we are going to continue to seek out uh, every opportunity to get federal and state grants to assist us in financing the, the work. Look at that, three minutes left. <laughs> Wow, we had way more questions this time. This is great. Fan, fantastic questions. Fantastic. All right, here we go, Charlotte. <laughs> Matt, how will you differentiate between overlying landowner allocation and water banked? Will you have the ability to make bankers whole if overlying landowners pump beyond their allocation? We, uh, as I indicated previously, we intend to meter uh, and monitor every single well within the MAGSA boundary so that we know exactly uh, who's producing what water from their wells. Uh, it's our intention to have all of our wells connected telemetrically uh, to, uh, to a, a central database management system. Uh, that will be uh, our ability to do real-time monitoring so we'll know who's doing what and if anybody's exceeding their allocation either uh, as just a direct uh, overdrafter or as an overdrafter of water belonging to somebody else. Yes, we'll have real-time monitoring of that. Uh, we also will have, uh, that's, that's important to us for a number of reasons, not only to assure our water banking partners that we're on top of what's happening with the subsurface flows, but, uh, but also for other things that we have planned for our water, water uh, our GSA, which are you know, water marketing platforms and, and efficiency, um, efficiency analysis for uh, some algorithms associated with, with uh, irrigation efficiency. So all that's going to be closely monitored. And, and yes, we'll have a, a real-time uh, ability to detect when uh, someone is exceeding their allocation. Matt, who is MAGSA considering for the groundwater accounting framework? Uh, that's slightly premature at this point. We need to we need to get few, uh, through a few uh, other preliminary checkboxes to get us there. Uh, that will be a determination made at the appropriate time for that accounting framework. Still got time to sneak one in. Oh. Maybe not. I see. I see the big <laughs> seven three zero now. But we would take another question if somebody had a burning yearning to get an answer. That's for sure. Okay. All right. Well. I well. Guess we don't. We have no more. Uh, who's left? Anybody still here? Oh yeah, we have quite. Almost everybody's still here. This is fantastic. So everybody's learning and asking, ah, he's back. All right. Ah. <laughs> well, okay. 
a bit evasive. I don't know about that. I just, it's hard to give you answers to questions that haven't been uh, answered as yet and aren't timely. Uh, as we indicated, and as Rain indicated, we have, we really have a serious, uh, you know, uh, focus on the environmental effects right now. And so we don't want to jump ahead in a process and skip anything. And so until we're satisfied uh, that we aren't going to make any uh, substantial negative impact, uh, we don't want to get ahead of ourselves. But thanks for the questions anyway, and feel free to ask me any of them that come up anytime you want. Well, if there are no more questions at this time, I believe that concludes the scoping meeting for the Magsa Aquaterra Water Bank project. Thank you all very much for your, for your interest and for those great questions. We will be putting uh, your questions and any comments that come in by December 3rd into a scoping summary report, which we will be part of the, uh, the administrative record and which will be attached to the, um, the CEQA and NEPA document when it is released. Um, that document will, uh, the, the, the public document will indicate how your comments were incorporated into the, uh, into the environmental evaluation and were addressed. And we look forward to receiving additional comments or questions over the course of the scoping period. Matt, did you have anything else to add? Just uh, wanted to say thanks to everybody who came and listened and is paying attention. And uh, hopefully uh, we can continue the conversation about this great water management possibility and, and really, really uh, take advantage of it as a, a regional water management uh, benefit for everybody involved in this area, not just MAGSA. Okay, I would like to thank Rebecca and Crystal for uh, facilitating tonight's meeting. I'd like to thank uh, uh, the participants from the Bureau of Reclamation uh, for, for attending and explaining your role in the, in the project. And I'd like to thank all the participants for, uh, for taking your time to participate in this, um, uh, in this, scoping, in this public scoping process. So uh, thank you. On a, on a light side note, Rarely will you have an opportunity to have two presenters, one who's named Rain and the other named Groundwater. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a tremendous uh, privilege to have both of those, those presenters uh, with us tonight. And hopefully uh, uh, each of them will continue to produce uh, the, that, uh, that resource level that is contained within their names. With that, I think we'll conclude. Thank you. Good night. Good night, all.